Welcome to the ATP Project. You're with your hosts, Matt, Steve, and Jeff. Guys, we're talking about... Matt, I'm going to let you introduce this one. Oh, well, Helico back to Pylori oh. as the bug. But what the hell? We come up with a catchy title and I already forgot. It was um, something acid, 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 no, acid, acid, acid. acid reflux and corrosive, corrosive bacteria. bacteria. Which because yes. yeah, Helico back to Pylori is not... Well, it's very catchy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Most people got it. <laughs> I, I, can say, I can say about Hector. But, and that's the thing is that, you know, obviously with the gut right, we're getting a lot of people giving feedback on all sorts of symptoms and conditions mm. and, you know, weird stuff that's happening to them. And there seemed to be a bit of a trend with this horrible bug that I have a huge difficulty in trying to pronounce. <laughs> I'm just going to call it Hector. But um, call it Hector. Hewlett, Hewlett Packard, you know, it's, it's Helicobacter pylori, but Hewlett Packard HP. So just very quickly, guys, break down on exactly what that bacteria is. Can I give you a bit of history? Do that. I love history. In 1982, I was in high school, second year, picking up girls as usual. But on another side of the world, an Australian scientist was discovering this bug that was causing ulcers in the gut. And he discovered, because before that, ulcers were caused and by... here you were picking up girls in was, high school, doing high nothing. School. Old mates over there invent, in discovering so this I went, I went to on. an old boys school when I was in form two. <laughs> anyway, but, um, you know, I was about young man, of course. And, of course, they discovered that, that ulcers used to be caused by, they thought, oh, gastric acids, you know, there's acids in your gut, that, that got to corrode things. But they discovered that these ulcers were caused by bacteria, and they then treated ulcers with, bac- with antibiotics, and it cured the ulcers, which is just weird yeah before that it was drinking milk and magnesia and a proton pump inhibitors antacids so what was the theory that we in, uh, get infected with this bug well it could be a commensal bug you could argue because it is over in commensal over, meaning oh meaning it's over 50 percent of the population that most people have it most people have it and uh it's it's less so in westernized countries hmm. and more so you want to you want to have the, the risk factors for getting it one of them is having a university degree and i'm not joking what having a university degree increases your chance of having having helicobacter pylori can you wow, believe well, that? Yeah, that's a strange one, man. Yeah, amazing. Why? Uh, that, that, well, I don't know why. It's, it's an association. But one of the great associations was the warmer the climate, the less helicobacter pylori. That yeah, was right. another association, yeah. That's, that's interesting. Yeah, so, I mean, with commensal bacteria, one, hmm. of the, one of the definitions or one of the criteria of commensal is they're supposed to be good for us. Yes, and they are good for you because uh, this, this back, this, some strains of the helicobacter pylori, because there's multiple strains, can protect you against asthma. What can protect you against asthma? So you know, the puffy so, thing. So we're, we're yeah, I know asthma. Yeah, I've got it. I had asthma most of my life. Yeah. I'm really curious because, um, so what you're saying? So we've got a bacteria that in over fifty percent of the population that naturally lives inside your stomach. Mm-hmm. In some cases, it's beneficial because it seems to protect us against asthma and other allergic conditions. Yes, as well. other allergies. Yeah, because I, I have seen some stuff with eosinophilic esophagitis yep. so that's a flash way of saying that i ate a food and my throat swelling up um some people get that just Impressive. as a weird histamine reaction mm. in their throat and they get the swelling throat and this helicobacter supposed and that's another allergic thing mm-hmm. asthma is allergic as well it is no oh, so, yeah john had a swelling in his throat but i think that was something different but anyway keep i think his throat that was swelling <laughs> <laughs> but, ooh, anyway so now so what so we're saying we get a bacteria yes now the immune system split and two sides. Ah. So one side kills infections like mm-hmm. bacteria mm-hmm. and also kills off cancers, kills yep. off all those sort of Viruses. immune surveillance that it kills little things. The other side flushes away allergies. So yeah. when the side that's up, that triggers asthma and yep. triggers um, swelling in the throat and allergies and intolerances. Mm-hmm. Don't laugh when I say swelling in the throat no, just because he's just turned <laughs> it into dirty. I'll go back to say eosinophilic esophagitis. That's it. So what we're saying is for people that are... Um, have allergic conditions. Yes. If you put this particular bacteria in their stomach, mm-hmm. it fixes those, and that's because of that seesaw analogy. So by stimulating Great. the antimicrobial defense, we reduce our allergic defense. Yeah. And yeah. Does it, it work? Yeah. It, 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 it's like a seesaw your immune system. You've got two parts. Hmm. As you said, one part kills worms, big parasites, by creating mucus that the worms just detach and fall out in the toilet. The other side kills viruses, bacteria. So if you get a chronic bacterial infection, the T helper one side goes up like a seesaw, and hmm. the T helper two side goes down. Now, this T helper two is responsible for asthma yeah. and allergy. So you, it drives it down a level. Levels it out, so that's why it can be beneficial for asthma. So I okay, got another theory. Then, oh, a question or a, yeah. if I have allergies, yes, and if I'm exposed to allergies and I continually challenge my allergic inflammation with exposure to big things like allergies, mm. 
pollens, yep. pesticides, uh, not pesticides, all I suppose, all that sort of crap, um, dusts and everything like that, and parasites. Mm. So if I have a lot of parasites and I've got a lot of allergies, mm. my TLP2 anti-allergic immune will be high. Yeah, very much so. Therefore, my immune surveillance will be low. Very much so. Allowing bugs to grow. Yeah, exactly. La- so I wonder la- which la- one comes bacteria. first because I get stuck in these things because this is the thing, it's an association. Yeah. So we're finding people with... Um, those T helper two. Well, what, have what, the what comes first now, is is two, but simply because you're born T helper two dominant. You're born T helper two dominant because a woman becomes T helper two dominant during pregnancy because of the hormone progesterone and doesn't want to reject the fetus. Correct. Yeah. You, don't, you don't want to kill the baby inside you. And T helper one fights off foreign tissue. And yeah. I don't want to be bad here, but a baby is a foreign tissue. Yeah, it's, it's only half yours and yeah, some other blokes. Mm. Um, hopefully you have your partners, but it may not be. Uh, we just got to, are you going to write that one down? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, no, I should be right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, it might slip through. So, so you know, this progesterone drives down T helper one, which drives up T helper two, so you don't kill your own baby. Yeah, right. Yeah. And so, hey, is there any link with helicobacter with pregnancy then? No, not that I could find. Yeah, because pregnancy, that's what happens. You get that immune shift too. There is a lot of reflux in pregnancy. Yeah. But that's probably because you're running out of room. Yeah, that's um, it. And I know when the pregnancy's over, um, the immune system balances out. The re- the baby mm. that is not there anymore, you have a little uh, bit more it's room. It's actually more technical. Yeah. It's prolactin that drives up T helper one post pregnancy. Yeah, right. Eh? So it's prolactin. That's cool. So that's so why the, prolactin. That's the pregnancy. Is... That's the breast milk hormone. Yeah. Mm. So as the breast milk hormone comes out, it says, right, you've obviously popped out your baby now. Um, TLP1 goes up. You can reboot your immune system. And that's why one of the first things you test if you've got a TLP1 dominant condition is prolactin in the blood. If it's too high, that's what can drive autoimmune disease. Wow, that's yeah. so cool, eh? Sort of. Oh, I mean, that, you that, that's one of the mechanisms why, remember, gamma linoleic acid or yeah. primrosol was good for arthritis? It yeah. drives down prolactin. Yeah, right. And eh? that's why it's contraindicated if you've got a, just had a baby. Huh. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, off topic, Dave. But yeah. Oh, but it's all good stuff. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So, so what we're talking about here is these people get this acid burn, acid reflux, mm, this mm, heartburn, mm. and that's what the main symptom with Helicobacter. Like it is. What, so, what, what's the go with Hector and acid? Yeah, sure. Well, Helicobacter pylori is an opportunistic infection that usually infects people with wait for this one low stomach acid. Because remember, stomach acid kills bugs. Okay, all of them, pretty much because it's so strong acid. But if you've got a slightly lower acid in your stomach, this bug can get in there and live. And once it's in your stomach, it burrows into your wall, which causes the ulceration, by the way. Yeah, right. And um, that protects itself from the acid because mucus comes in behind it and seals up the gap and the the bug lives forever inside the gut. Yeah, and And it can just eat away and ulcerate and it protects it from the acid. But does it make more acid? Does Does it respond with making no, the it, acid that causes No, it do, doesn't reflux? make more, more acid. No, it doesn't. It doesn't make more acid. The parietal cells make the acid mm. and it can therefore you can have high acid after that because it's already buried itself in there. It's yeah. kind of like gets through the gaps while the defenses are down because yeah. the stomach acid is a defense mechanism because you eat yeah. all this food that's full of bugs. Sterilize whatever's coming in. Should be. Yeah. But if I like the back to Except those extremophiles. Extremophiles. Like Jeff <laughs> yeah, and John when they travel. No, so. no, these are the extremophiles, and they live in extreme conditions. Like they live in extreme um, ex- heat or extreme acidity, acidity, and and extreme environments like the Yellowstone uh, National Park, like on Mars. They're, oh, yeah? they're the bugs that are producing methane. What would you say, Yellowstone National Park on or Mars? Ma- or Mars? Or Mars? Oh. The stream of files live on Mars. It's been everywhere. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he knows everything. I've been, I've been to Mars. You ever been yeah, to that sure. national park on Mars yet? Yeah. <laughs> the one with the giant what are you face. Doing? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> the pyramid. That's right. And so that's why, um, you know, these things. That's why all that methane's in Mars, and they, I mean, all, all the NASA are excited about that. That they can't. They're looking for these extreme of files, I and mean, they're they're sending some rovery thing up there. Soon yeah. and and it's interesting stuff. Yeah. So basically, so what we've said so far is. With the natural, because this is the weird thing with naturopathic medicine, we always used to have this theory that acid reflux occurs in often. You've got two types of people. Some mm. people just genuinely make way too much acid. Mm. Actually, it's probably three. Some people make normal amounts of acid but have a mechanical issue mm. where the sphincter in the top of the stomach is not capable of keeping the acid in the stomach. Because regardless whether it's relatively weak acid or strong acid, if it's in your throat, it hurts. Mm. Yeah, so there's three things. So you've either got people that just make way too much acid and it's mm. constantly spilling out in response to weird foods and things like that. Mm. Other people make normal acid, but they've got a mechanical issue because they spend too much time drinking and vomiting or something like that where the, the, the mm. uh, sphincter at the top just doesn't work. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the third group of people that got low stomach acid, dodgy digestion, 
And then as the undigested food moves past, it takes about an hour or so before the acid starts churning, but by then the stomach's got the, the food's moved on. Mm. So and with, it ferments and forms gas and rises the yeah, acid and then, contents yeah, up. And then bloats every and pushes everything back up through that sphincter. Mm. So when we're talking to these people that have got reflux reflux, fifty odd percent of the people um, in the population have got Helicobacter pylori. Yeah. When they eradicate that Helicobacter pylori, does it fix the reflux? Doesn't often fix the reflux because yeah. the, because the reflux, as you said, both caused by a lot of things. It's often uh, Helicobacter pylori is, is often associated with low stomach acid, mm. and low stomach acid can cause reflux too because you get instead of the food digesting it ferments and forms gases, and the gas pushes the contents of the stomach up, and a little bit of its acid burns the esophagus. That's one of the mechanisms. So it could be low stomach acid. Yeah. But the Helicobacter pylori, once you get rid of that. That gets rid of the ulcers. Yeah, exactly. Now, but this is reflux. my thing. Okay, yeah. so the the medical, the world medical established mm. treatment for this is a, what they call triple therapy. Yep. It's all I remember, but it was basically suppress the acid. Yep. Kill the bug. Yep. What's the third one? No, no. There's, oh, it's there's three antibiotics. There's three so. antibiotics and a PPI, which is a proton pump inhibitor which is an or an antacid. antacid. Yeah. Now, so the plan is if you get diagnosed with Helicobacter pylori, which is an asshole of a thing to be diagnosed with because mm. you've got to do this painful hydrogen breath test, which is um, means you've got to have nil by mouth for like 12 hours. 12 hours or fasting, it's, yeah. it's crazy. Like it's a really hard test for do. You can't even sip waters and all sorts of stuff. Mm. Or you've got to go in and do it. At <coughs> get a bit early and mm. just do it for in the morning. Yeah, yeah. So that's what most people do. And it's a bit of a challenge um, to do the test. So a lot of people struggle with a diagnosis anyway. Mm. But for those people that are diagnosed, they're prescribed an antacid. Um, and then antibiotics. Yes. And then after the eradication of the Helicobacter pylori, they're left on the antacid. Yes. And that's the long-term trade. They use antibiotics short-term. They take the antacid forever. But we just said right at the start, that if you're suppressing stomach acid, you're predisposed to Helicobacter pylori infection. You can get reinfected. And if we have adequate there. acid, we yeah. can sterilize it and stop it from coming back Absolutely. when it comes in on our food. Yeah. So, so the why take the antacid? Because you've got reflux. Yeah. So this is the point. It suppresses the symptom. And this is and it's it's one of those grey areas mm. because if you get enough acid reflux ulcerating and damaging your esophagus, you I mean you get throat cancer or you can get mm. all of these a lot of problems, you know, esophageal cancers that typically come from acid reflux mm. and that sort of stuff. So we gotta manage that. Mm. But we don't, it's a quite a weird thing. So, with this Helicobacter pylori, we've found a lot of people that do our, when Jeff mentioned earlier the gut right product, mm. what we're talking about are mod biotic compounds. They're poisonous polyphenol compounds out of foods, and we're trying to knock off a lot of the bugs. Mm. What happened is we get a lot of people out there that are doing this protocol. Some of them have come back and said they're getting bad reactions to the point that they went to a doctor, and the doctor did a test and found they had Helicobacter pylori. Like you say, 50% of the people have already. Everyone, Everyone, every second person's yeah. already got it. Yeah. Just because it's there and you've got these symptoms doesn't mean it's causing the symptoms. Correct. Um, so that, that's the, one of the reasons why I wanted to tell people that when we start doing these um, poisons, these mm. antimicrobial poisons, we're actually starting to create some change. Stirring something yeah, up. Yeah, all of a sudden you're <coughs> starting to break up. Now, what Steve-O said is really important to understand about Helicobacter pylori is if you imagine your gut wall, you get, it's like meat, okay? And then it's got this mucus coating. The mucus coating is proportional to the amount of acid you got. The mucus protects the tissue from acid. So when you've got lots of acid, you get lots of thick mucus through your gut. If you've got low stomach acid, you get a thinner mucus coating, you get a thinner membrane. Mm. Within that mucus is your IgA compounds, your immune, your T helper 1 immune yep. cells that are your immune surveillance and everything as well. So what happens? You get low stomach acid for a period of time. That allows Helicobacter pylori bacteria to grow. Um, it also allows the mucus to kind of mucus and immune surveillance to drop off a touch. Next thing you know, the helicobacter is into the meaty tissue. It then starts eating holes because it's corrosive, flesh-eating mm. bug. It'll actually create a hole, mm. but then behind it, over the top of it, the mucus forms. Mm. So the challenge is... is kind of slips in and... and... But once it's there, it's really hard to treat. Mm. Now... The way we treat it naturally, you did the slipped in thing, didn't you? He, you should, oh. Don't do those hand motions in front of you. It's the noise more than it's anything. Like, oh, the noise. Like this, it goes. <laughs> oh, Steve, <laughs> oh. oh, what was Steve? That? He's right Can you there, keep but... it PG, please? <laughs> <PG>. Congress tart. <laughs> <laughs> Congress tart. That's my safe word. Don't show By you. the way, that's it. So when you do that, even that. Congress tart. Congr that's my safe I word. I was in Washington last week. I met a few of them. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we're talking about polyphenol mod biotic yes. compounds stirring up Helicobacter pylori, and I'm going to tell you how. <sighs> Do you get it? Mm -hmm. So, 
in one of the most powerful things to eradicate, um, what are we talking about? Helicobacter pylori <laughs> mm-hmm. within the natural world is actually cranberry. Mm. Um, we took we put mega doses of cranberry into the gut right, like really big doses. And you can only really do it because in a product like gut right because you get that astringency. Mm. Otherwise, you just can't handle oh, those yes. big doses. And we can Tough. cover it up with some of the other ingredients, the spicier stuff. Um, so anyway, the point is, what cranberry does is it actually breaks down that surface tension on that mucus protective coating Mm -hmm. across the helicobacter pylori when we talk about it burrowing in and protecting itself with mucus that is a biofilm Mm. yeah so what cranberry does is it breaks down that biofilm and actually gets between the bacteria and the mucus membrane and puts these acid compounds Mm. not alkalizer it's not a urinary alkalizer that's Mm. a scam Oh, it's uh, are you talking it's about UTI infections? Yeah, because everyone takes cranberry. cranberry saying because it's urinary alkalizer. It doesn't. It puts a particular acid compound through your urine. If anything, it's an acidifier it's of the membrane. It's a acid of membrane. Now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. Um, and then it coats and it coats the mucous membranes, and that acid stops bacteria from binding um, into the membrane. So what happens when you've got a Helicobacter pylori and you start doing mega doses of something like gut right, which contains big doses of cranberries and other compounds that, and pomegranates and other things that break down the, um, biofilm, uh-huh. all of a sudden your immune system finds this bug and then it starts attacking it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, in some cases that does create things to get worse because you create an immune reaction. Mm. So the way to address that is, um, you basically, it's hard to know, really. You go case-by-case case basis. It depends on how bad you're going. But the good news and one thing that we have checked is that if you work with your doctor to do that triple target and you can use cranberry with it, it works even better again. 89% effective. Yeah, because the antibiotics can't get to the helicobacter pylori unless they break up the biofilm. Mm-hmm. That's how it lives there for ages. And that's why when we use just poisons and try to get zincs in there and things like that, you got to kind of, it's quite hard to access. And mm. the whole purpose of actually creating, um, using something to break up the biofilm with antimicrobial means that you get the poison plus you've broken up their protective case. Biofilms like plaque on your teeth. You know how the bacteria on your teeth, they protect mm. themselves on the show? That, that's what Everyone's looking in their teeth right now. Yeah, right. why are you just doing that? I don't know. I'd brush mine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's very cool. Yeah, now, I thought so. Now, the, the, other, bad thing, <laughs> the other bad thing about helicobacter pylori is it does. If, it, if it's inflammatory and infectious, causes cancers. And oh. the only problem with that, yeah. that's well. a problem on its own, is the antacids prescribed are associated with a five-fold increased risk of cancer. It was published in gut last year. I wonder so which one come for, under which is the stat then? The what? I wonder what the stat... Is it helicobacter pylori increases your risk of cancer or is it that helicobacter pylori people get reflux, take antacids, and antacids cause cancer? Well, both. Because helicobacter stirs up an inflammatory response and the antacids increase cancer risk in the gut. And if we go back to the start, yeah. people with a T helper 2 dominance are predisposed to helicobacter pylori. Yep. And those people have got a T helper 1... Mm. Remember, I right start, I said immune surveillance from the T upper one protects against bacteria and cancer. And right. it get, so gets this worse. is where I get with these associations. It's like if your immune system is allowing bacteria to grow, they're also allowing cancer to grow. And it gets worse. What? Because if you have low stomach acid, you produce nitrosamines in your gut, which are cancer forming. So what so does nitrosamines do? Nitrosamines are potent cancers. And they're, they're related to the family of the nitrates, which are preservatives in you cured meats. Say, yeah, 150 say, is yeah. the code. And nitrates are, are very, very bad for you. And, you know, cured, you get, and the, cured meats. So if yeah. you happen to have this condition and you ate a lot of cured meats, that could oh. exacerbate the, the situation. You'd or be worse, in massive if you trouble. ate a lot of cured meats and used antacids, would be a bigger risk. Massive. Cause, Ooh, cause, the antacids do risk. And most people have a preserved mm. meat. Like we're talking about a cabana or a pepperoni yep. or something like that, that. A lot of people that would predispose them to a reflux would then take an antacid. Wow. Yeah, it's yeah. scary stuff. This is really bad, bad cancer. Yeah. Now, they, they, they are related to the nitrates. There's only one good thing about nitrates, and it's the only joke I say. Mm. It's, uh, they're cheaper than day rates. Oh. oh that's what I say to students. No, they're not, actually. They're yeah. more expensive. So that's, it, that's, a, <laughs> that's not true. I know. That's true. So, so they're absolutely we're really bad for gastric an- cancers here. And then if you've got, you take something, a drug like ibuprofen, uh, which is pretty common, isn't it? You get it from supermarkets. Yeah. You know? 
That's pretty common, right? Yeah. For, for our friends in the States, that's is there Advil, Advil, that sort of Advil, stuff? Yeah. Yeah. Advil, yeah. Advil, any of those? Nurofen, yeah. If you take those, they're COX-1 inhibitors. You know that beautiful yep. mucus Matt was talking about? COX-1 is well, the enzyme. Beautiful mucus. He loves that. He said COX-1. And he ah. loves that, that <laughs> beautiful <laughs> mucus. I love that. Well, I was going to say cyclooxygenase 1. I can't, can't really... Oh, I reckon you should after Yeah, actually, I probably should Cox after you... Cox-Saki B virus episode. <laughs> so that, that enzyme makes you, all this What do you guys get up to when I'm not here? Oh, and I don't want to know. Anyway, yeah. keep going. You Steph. don't want to watch that last Congress podcast. Start. Yeah, so, so, so <laughs> this, <apple> <laughs> this enzyme protects the gut. And if you take a drug like that, it inhibits that protection. So yeah, does right. indomycin, uh, naproxen, Voltaren. So what, what Steve is saying is these drugs, what they do is they... St- so with our inflammatory triggers, we get two different types. COX-1 mm. um, and COX-2. So COX-1 prote- creates a nice protective mucus layer that lubricates arteries, mm. kidneys, gut wall. COX-2 is, is inflammatory. It's induced when you get a reaction. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So they always want to block COX-2 and leave COX-1 alone. But right. they seem to block both. They block they? both because yeah. they're well, not they, that clever. They're, they're, they just block, they're just COX blockers. <laughs> Wow. Typically, I've met a few of those, and then and then what happens is these cox blockers <laughs> they get into your gut. You get this weak mucous membrane, yes. and what did we say before? The whole thing with Helicobacter pylori, you get a little bit of low stomach acid. You get a, a weaker membrane with less mucus. The little bugger gets an opportunity, an opportunistic commensal bacteria gets past your normal defence and mm. starts eating holes in your body. Mm. So the treatments is always about protecting that mucus coating, protecting that um, integrity of your gut wall to make sure that things can't just slip in. In your stomach, controlling acid at the right time is extremely important. Mm. So most of the Helicobacter pylori, does it come in on food and stuff? Yeah, food. Food born. Uh, So most of the time we're going to get it into us, it's with our meals. Yes. So around meal time, it's really important Mm. to make sure you prime your stomach with Uh good levels of stomach acidity. Yeah. So prior to a meal, now I'm going to say things like um, apple cider vinegars and things like that. And Steve-O's going to be thinking in his mind, oh, the pH of hydrochloric (laughs) acid is actually much higher or more acidic and lower number than it is with the vinegars. But the point is, why we use the vinegars is not actually to replace our stomach mm. acid, but to activate our vagus nerve yes. on our tongue to let our stomach know we're about to eat. Mm. Yeah, that's Because we're always eating on Iran and we're all doing this sort of stuff. But if you have something acidic and bitter mm. and warm, mm. like so if you do warm water and acidic... Yeah. Tony bought that, some unbelievable miso soup the other day. Man, it was good. Yum. Yeah, so you see... Um, taking a soup entree or having yeah. a salad entree with a vinaigrette or mm. having a cup of tea that's got bitter stuff or having a water with vinegar and that sort of stuff before a meal primes the vagus nerve which tells your stomach you're about to eat mm. and bring all that stuff get ready for food mm. and, and then, then and then the stomach acid makes mm. it, is prepared and then as the food comes in mm-hmm. with the helicobacter it's sterilizing it mm. oh, i've got some good news on the drug front though um they're, they're you managed to get on yeah, yeah, got <laughs> um, there, there are there are selective COX two inhibitors that probably a lot of people are on these days. Just selectively inhibit COX two and leave COX one alone. That's mm-hmm. good. Vioxx is it was one for that. Um, yep. Oh, um, isn't that yeah. the one that caused strokes? Yeah, yeah, heart yeah, attack. I was going to say, hang on, pick no. your poison. Yeah, <laughs> but apart from dying from a heart attack, it was safer for your gut. Didn't upset your tummy. Oh, mm. you happy about that? Not really. Oh, yeah, I suppose. We come to think of it, being dead is probably. Worse. Uh, that, that was rip- ripped off the market after it killed, you know, tens of thousands. So oh, good. It was taken off the market. Yeah, it's taken off. There's still some COX-2 inhibitors out there, mm. so just be careful. Unfortunately, in the trials, those people were put into the non-responder group, <laughs> which is why it got onto yeah, the market. They weren't responding with. because they're picking up their hand and it's like <laughs> popping that down again. They were, they they're were, never responding ever again. They, they weren't responding yeah. to the CPR given to them after no, the break, no. yeah. Oh, man. Oh. So, there's this joke I heard the other day. Oh, and there's this bloke sitting the in the bar. And the, then the waitress comes up and says, hey, does, yeah, in a big panic, does anyone know CPR? And then this bloke goes, mate, I know the whole fucking alphabet. <laughs> <laughs> and we all laughed and laughed except one guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he just uh, lay there, eh? Yeah. Oh, so anyway. He's a bit of a stiff. So what we found is with the natural stuff, a lot of the natural stuff that works, works by controlling digestive stuff, maintaining a stomach acidity, mm. maintaining a mucus barrier integrity, but more importantly, breaking up biofilm so that your natural stomach acid can sterilize these bastard of bugs and um, also break up biofilm so your immune system can get into it and eat it all up and other compounds in your diet. Mm. So the things that we found to be the best naturally mm. were things like cranberry. Yep. It was definitely the best. Um, yeah. Things like turmeric and that sort of stuff were also very good. Also so yeah. very good. What else was showing up? Steve garlic though? was great because it's anti-bacterial. Any like good garlic. Like Seriously, yeah. garlic is so good. Garlic yeah. is brilliant. 
Uh, ginger's good because it's anti-inflammatory, mm. anti-ulcer. Just be careful. Sorry, Steve, to interrupt, yeah, but I just need right. because I forget my my mind will stop. Um, the um, garlic and gingers and things like that are very good at killing the bug, but they're also very good blood thinners. Mm. So it's very important to make sure if you do have a stomach ulcer that it's not bleeding because that will kill you too. Mm. Um, and way to know if you've got a bleeding stomach ulcer. Um, it's hard to, t- apart from a test, sometimes people cough up blood. That's mm, an obvious sign. blood in the poo? Yeah, yeah. But, norm- but because the blood is coming from the stomach lining, it means it, gets, it drips out into the acid and then it starts to get digested. So it's very different. You don't see it just like a black poop or you don't see yeah, it like right. um, a red, fresh blood in okay. the poo. You could cough up and vomit up fresh blood. But normally what happens, as the blood hits the acid, it forms like a little blood clot and looks like coffee granules. You know, yep. like a little black speck. So your poo comes out looking like chocolate chip cookies. Mm. Oh. Don't mm. eat it. <laughs> those chunks, it's like a... No, I won't Normally say. you would, but you just shouldn't eat those ones. Is that what you're saying? You, you know, with your poo? What? You yeah. normally eat your poo, but no. not the ones with the I had a rabbit that did that. What's that called again? Autophagy. Oh, autophagy. Well, and autophagy. if it's your mate, yeah. it's coprophagy. <laughs> In the face. Cop it. <laughs> <laughs> Yuck. Anyway, so <laughs> that's messed up. So if you have shit, uh, like if you have um, chocolate chip cookie poo, don't mm. eat it. It could be raisins. <laughs> no, 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 it's um, <laughs> that's a dirty trick, eh? When you think you're getting a chocolate chip cookie and those little specks turn out to be raisins. Mm-hmm. Anyway, we're talking mm. about poo that looks like it, so don't eat that. Mm. Um, and you see specks in it, or they'll cough up those specks. So in amongst when they're coughing up, they'll cough up like coffee granules and mm. stuff, or vomit it out. It'll be in their vomit. Um, mm. Or you get you get a very acidic taste in your mouth, and you can actually taste blood in your mouth. So mm. those people go, oh, I just got this constant feeling. Often they suffer with anemia. Mm. Now the right. challenge is because they're constantly losing blood, they're anemic. So the next thing that the doctors will prescribe, typically because that's iron. where they're going, mm. is a dodgy iron that gets absorbed very poorly, mm. like uh, ferrogradum and so what are they called? Iron what sulfate. Iron sulfate. Fifol is the drug. Yeah. And they buy, they basically really struggle to absorb. Um, and if you've got low stomach acid, you get no absorption. Mm. So they prescribe. Because these people have got heartburn and reflux and a bleeding ulcer, they give them an antacid and then they give them iron to fix their anemia. Doesn't the get goal absorbed. is just to go back and fix that ulcer because unless you fix those bleeding ulcers and unless you fix the membrane, we can't do anything about acidity. And you try filling up a bucket with a hole in it. You know why would you be trying to top up anemia until you eventually stop the bleed? You yeah. know, and so they, they'll often go through and say, "We've got to fix the anemia. Come back, and we'll, we'll surveil. You know, we'll watch this for like twelve months." Yeah, it's, it's unexplained anemia is what you've got to watch for. So mm. if people who have heavy menstruation and don't eat mud, much red meat and they've got no GI symptoms, that's, that's explainable. Mm. But if you've got, you know, you eat a fair bit of red meat and you're, say, a male that doesn't lose blood every month mm. and they've just got unexplained anemia, yeah. with low whatever, it's like, why? Mm. Uh, then that's going to worry. And the first thing I'll ask is, are you taking aspirin or, or anti-inflammatories? Because they cause the ulcers. The Second thing bleeding. is, yeah. Mm. So you've got to be careful of that. And, and that's scary because, mm. you know, you don't want to be bleeding. So blood coming out of other parts of the bowel, mm. like in the intestine, it'll come, your whole poo goes black. Yep. Um, if it's in your stomach, it's like little um, specks. Um, and if it's coming out of bum grapes or something like that, it's fresh, not hemorrhoids and that. It's like fresh red, red blood. blood. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you can do a you can do a fecal uh, occult blood test. Occult means hidden. Yep. So you get your um, go to the doctor, ask for a little box, and you poop in the toilet, pull yep. some out, put it in the box, send it off, and it comes back. See if you got any blood in your poo. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Um, we're talking about how much blood gets in the stool. So mm. if you've got those unexplained anemia, ulcers could be a cause, and the cause of the ulcers is usually this particular bug. Mm. Mm. The way we treat it is lots of modbiotic compounds, antimicrobial sort of stuff, just natural antibiotic things, mm. but combine them with such things as cranberries and turmerics, mm. um, pomegranate peels, all those sort of things that help to break down the biofilm to let the microbes get to it. Mm. But the long-term treatment to prevent it is not and acids. The long-term no. treatment is to actually help restore the stomach. So some people need to get a scan down to make sure that the top of their stomach is capable of working because some people have these... Um, what do they call those things? No, what's that? The, um, oh, bloody hell. Hiatus hernias? Yeah, hiatus hernias and that sort of stuff where they're getting the symptoms and there's not much... It's normal acid, mm. no infection. They've just structurally, they've got a problem in the mm. top of their stomach. Mm. Those people, what we need to do is not just stop the acid. The key is, is to protect the membranes. Mm. So any, even low acid, like I said, weak acid burns if it's in the wrong spot. Mm. Um, so what we need to do is put a coating across the mucous membranes. The best things that do that are things like the slippery on bark. Mm. I, used to, I used to make, in my naturopath clinic, I used to just mix up meadowsweet, marshmallow, calendula, licorice, 
and cranberry. Hmm. And that was like my old blend just for that because it would actually go through and help to break up all the stuff but put a nice soothing coating. Yeah. At home, there's some little tricks you can do if you're getting that acid reflux. Like seriously, you could buffer it with bicarb. Hmm. So you can put sodium bicarbonate in. Don't do too much or it just bubbles too much and you get a lot more bloating. Hmm. And that's very fast and straight. Hmm. Almond skins and pistachios. Hmm. So if you have pistachios... So if you're snacking, if you're one of those people that tends to get heartburn when you go to bed at night, as soon as you lie flat because you've got this structural disorder, snacking on almonds, raw almonds with their skin on, yeah. or you can activate and put them in some water if you want, but it's the skin that does it. Mm. Um, and pistachio that are <laughs> raw with those, it's actually pistachio resin mm. that does it, and the resin comes from that little bit of skin yeah. that's left on it. So it's better if skin. you get the pistachios in the things. You, you hate can, the skin. I love the skin. Oh, yeah. me too. Yeah, nut salty, skin. Young. Yeah, you yeah, want nut yeah. skins are really good for these things because they put this particular coating across. They help to break up biofilm and they also contain polyphenols. I've always advocated nut skin. Yeah. yeah, you love it. Mm. I've seen sometimes you just talk about it. Mm. <laughs> I don't know why you guys talk about that. <laughs> it's just terrible. So, was that it? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything else, Steve? I don't know. I was on, well, well can, I, can I give you a, a, a weird fact? Yes. No. This this bug has been traced back sixty thousand years to original. You know when when they were you know for sixty thousand years out of our Africa. This thing's been with us a long time. Yeah. How, right. how do they trace it back sixty thousand years? Uh, you Steve can like? do you can do DNA testing and, and measure the age of a DNA. Yeah. Wow. It's it's impossible radio considering the Earth's only seven. Oh yeah, years. that's right. Yeah. Oh. Well, well, seven thousand years old. <laughs> well, like the HIV virus is only fifty <laughs> years old. You know, in humans. The HIV. Yeah. yeah. Fifty. Yeah, because it was said to come out of things like vaccines that they were giving to monkeys mm. and that sort of stuff. It's not a whole story, another story, but it's a new yeah, virus yeah, to yeah. human Ooh. sort of oh, conspiracy, oh, conspiracy theory. No, it's not a conspiracy. Oh. It's actually oh. true. Oh, well, let's no. have a look at that then. No. I can't. That's a podcast waiting. Is to, it? Yeah. Mm. Wait, wait, oh, wait, 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 waiting to get knocked drama. off by oh, it's just CIA a fact. after yeah. that one. <laughs> Uh, but but you know it's it's pretty interesting all this sort of stuff. But, oh, but so yeah. this thing's been around a long time anyway. So it's. I need just quickly talk about zinc. Yeah. Now, another thing that we do, because zinc is absolutely important for healing over the mucous membranes. We need the zinc in there yes. to actually be able to heal. Now, there's some really cool papers. And in my clinic, I always used to use zinc carnosine mm. specifically for stomach ulcers based on the fact that there was a couple of good papers talking about zinc carnosine. Mm. I, tried, I couldn't find any mechanisms of action at the time other than that this one showed to be better than some of the others. Mm. Um, but if you understand carnosine, carnosine... So carnosine is an intracellular acidity buffer. Mm. So it lives inside. So for example, for sports performance, we take beta alanine. Mm. Beta alanine breaks down to, uh, so beta alanine gets absorbed, joins up with histidine and makes carnosine mm. in your muscles. The reason why I don't give carnosine to people to put carnosine into their muscles is because when you take carnosine, it breaks down to 50% beta alanine, uh -huh. 50% histidine. And if I've got a three gram space, I'm going to give you beta alanine because mm. three grams of beta alanine is equivalent to six grams of carnosine mm. based on that theory. The mm. rate limiting fact is beta alanine. So yeah. I, that makes sense to me. The rest of you might not be able to follow and you can ask the question. But is that why zinc carnosine is there any reason why zinc carnosine would be better than just providing zinc yes. because what i'm looking at is zinc is it bound to carnosine does zinc and carnosine work as a they work thing? synergistically because they tried magnesium carnosine or like and just carnosine yep. or something they don't work it's yep. the combination of zinc getting in there and healing the tissues when is it l carnosine or d carnosine uh l so so we're looking at the form that the body can incorporate into yeah. tissue so so does it go so that carnosine then would because you don't have to absorb it into the body yeah that carnosine will be absorbed intact into the gut inside the gut cells yeah. the cells in the gut and where it is there it protects those cells from acid yeah so that's kind of cool though it so that's cool. how there's in carnosine pa paper in 2000 can you do it with beta alanine so if you took beta alanine the beta alanine will get gut. absorbed into the cells. It'll get the histidine from the local environment. Yeah, so there'll yeah. be a percentage of the beta alanine that we take for our muscles that yeah. will actually make carnosine in the gut wall, huh? It could, yeah. Yeah, so that's what I keep, I'm trying to get work out whether, because when you have a look at these zinc carnosine studies, we're looking at about, I think it's about 140 milligrams of zinc carnosine, yes. which yields about 10, 15 milligrams much, of yeah. zinc. So we're only looking at 100 milligrams of carnosine. It's tiny. Mm. But we do, like, for example, infrared's got 3,000 milligrams, or a standard dose of beta alanine is probably 3,000 milligrams yeah, or something like that, yeah. which is equivalent to 6,000 milligrams of carnosine supplements. So in theory, if we were to load, for people with beta alanine, they might actually be building up carnosine in their muscles and that can incorporate with the zinc 
Yeah, that's cool, huh? So it's cool. Because cool. zinc carnosine is bloody expensive and it's very hard to get. Yeah. And um, a lot of people don't understand exactly how to use it. It's so, a weird one. Yeah, so you can use it. And if you do, you do about 140 milligrams from memory of zinc carnosine three times a day to liberate that amount of equivalent of zinc. Dude, do you want another cool fact that I was when I was researching this, I found interesting? Yeah. Do you know how turmeric kills the microbe? No. How it gets No. By the, by the shikimate pathway. The same pathway that glyphosate uses to kill plants. Ooh. So Tell us more stops, about that. It stops the bacteria making the amino acids for its growth. Yep. Like, like, like that pathway is in plants and plants make these amino acids. We just consume the amino acids. Oh, we right haven't right. got this pathway. That's why... Turmeric's okay for us. Well, it's okay for us and that's why glyphosate is okay for but us. But could you then create... Oh. But it's not okay for no, us. No, because it is for us, yeah. for us, but not for our gut bugs yeah it's not actually for the bacteria that live with inside us because it kills the bugs because it kills the pathway so, that they create you know, so yeah terrible. and that, that's a technicality i yeah. guess isn't it yeah. so so therefore could turmeric be used as um to kill weeds? herbicide possibly huh because it works in the gut that, that's what i was getting to i don't know if it does um but i would imagine it <coughs> would because it's one of those plants that could it could use its its power to kill other plants in its area yeah mm. yeah, yeah you know it could I don't know. I'm making that up. But I know that's yeah. how the mechanism of it works it's to kill the bacteria in the gut. That's cool. Isn't it a cool one? Yeah. Well, I thought you'd like that one. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. the cool thing about um, turmeric as well, it is as more of a specific COX-2 inhibitor yep. than a lot of the drugs. So it's a very powerful anti-inflammatory we talked about before that is also soothing to your mucosa. Very good for your gut. Um, so you, we've got natural yeah. anti-inflammatories that, don't, that are inf- anti-inflammatory wherever they touch, not yeah. just anti-inflammatory here, Seriously. but inflammatory there. The, ma- the amount of <clears throat> turmeric that I'm having at the moment is just ridiculous, like serious. Like even Tony's got this um, chai tea at the moment that we have at night, which is absolutely beautiful. Mm. And we have that instead of um, like black tea. Mm. And uh, as I said, I mean, and the anti-inflammatory effects, I mean, I went and saw the um, the doctor. I had needed to get signed off to go back and play um, soccer. Mm. And uh, two weeks later, and I've got full range of motion, no problem, going back to play soccer tomorrow. So that's And again, but a lot of that's been based on a lot of the anti-inflammatories that Matt's put me onto, which I think turmeric has been a huge part of that. So. I've just been staying up all night watching the World Cup. Amazing. Oh, did you hear what happened in Nigeria? No. So Nigeria lost to Argentina, mm-hmm. only by one goal. Yeah. But they were so upset... That they about their performance. That there's a particular Nigerian prince that's prepared to refund everyone's money. All you got to do is give him your bank details, your passwords, or your pin numbers, and yeah. everything. Wow, that's yeah. awesome! Oh, I've already <laughs> sent mine off. <laughs> and Rebecca's, you oh, know, wow. I didn't even go to the game. Yeah, yeah, so no, just, why just not? might be just the same Nigerian pe- uh, prince that's actually been sweetheart talking to me. You know. Yeah, yeah. Hi, Mombasa, if you. Yeah, I mean, mean, I've inherited a fortune. Mm. I'm just waiting. Yeah, Yeah, I've just paid my um, ten thousand or something to get my forty million. That's right. No problem. Yeah, that makes sense. (laughs) No, no, that didn't happen. Oh dear, that was a joke. Dear dear. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I've got another weird fact about Helicobacter pylori. In one study, it was found to regulate stomach acid secretion. The good brand. The good. Hey, now say that again. Start again. So, Helicobacter pylori. Is Helicobacter pylori Helicobacter pylori? No, there's what? different strains. Are they all called pylor- Helicobacter pylori? Yeah, there's just different. You know how there's there's like flus and then the the RNA shifts yeah. in it every year. Yeah. That's why yeah. your vaccine doesn't work, and, and yeah. that's why you know antibiotics don't work because there's DNA mutations yeah. and shifting of the, the thing. This thing has shifted a bit over the years, and it, it's found, I guess, that that the shifts of some of them have been beneficial. So for the host. how do you know? So if you get a test and yeah, they say you you're, you're positive for Helicobacter pylori, yeah, um, you, don't, that, you don't know. And if that's it, the problem. It depends on your symptom picture. Exactly. And 85% of people are asymptomatic with a positive Helicobacter pylori test. So if I went and got tested, there's, there's four people in this room now. Now, statistically, two of us have this bug in us. Yep. And it may not matter at all. But one and a half of those two people might have a problem. Might no. Well, so, actually, half so of those. So, fifty percent of the popula- fifty-two percent of the population have, have it. it. Yeah. Of the people that have it, eighty-five percent of the people, it's there, causing no problems. No problems at all. Maybe beneficial. So, yeah. So we've got to look at the symptom picture, mm. not just eradicate things just in case. Um, because if it's there and it's not causing problems, it might actually be challenging your immune system, reducing your predisposition to allergies and all yeah. that sort of stuff. It might all and cancer and yep. that sort of thing. Um, it might also be regulating your pH and your working stomach, yeah. uh, through competitive exclusion to keep the baddies out. Absolutely, that's what this paper was saying. Is here's another bad. Does thing it still for you. ulcerate the wall? Uh, no. You're just asymptomatic. Happily lives there, just lives there, covers itself in yep. mucus and just You're tells fine. all the others to keep away. You live with it. 
it, it's like some people living with HIV. Yeah, right. Uh, in South Africa, they, they have the HIV infection. And yeah, yeah. And your, your T cells are fine. Yeah. Um, that's because they've got a, a HLA B27 or sub, subset of their genes, which keeps their immune system cooking. Yeah, right. And only about 8% have, have that same sort of gene, so it's rare. But the other thing about Helicobacter pylori, which is very interesting, is if you treat it with triple antibiotic therapy, remember, these antibiotics, they give them three that are very poorly absorbed in the mm. body, so it stays in the gut. Yep. That makes sense? And it causes absolutely massive devastation of the gut. And that can't be overstated. It kills pretty much everything to a, to a pee. It's Helicobacter, just the stomach, huh? Yeah. yeah. But, but your pill doesn't go in there, stop there, and it yeah. goes all the way through. And it's a horrendous. It's a, it's a massacre in the that, that You showed me a paper where the P values were like point zero 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 zero, and then quickly just throw one in because we're just running out of space. Exactly. So that, that means it's extremely statistically extremely, significant. It kills everything. So these antibiotics, the triple therapy, creates significant dysbiosis, mm. which will alter your immune system, alter your mucosa, because what we've got to understand is a lot of the mucus coatings through the digestive tract are controlled by reflex. Yes. So you might get a, um, the, your bacteria in your lower bowel, the way your body responds to them and creates mucus could control the amount of mucus you make in your stomach and throat protecting you from acid. Absolutely. And it gets worse because one of the antibiotics is amoxicillin, which is extraordinarily wow. broad spectrum. Yeah. So it kills all of them, not just... It's Except not just candidas and that. Yeah, so yeah, then well, all the fungi yeah, and everything yeah, yeah, overgrows. Yeah, they overgrow. So, so it's really a train wreck if you get this treated. So you've got to be careful. Don't just waddle off to the docs and go, oh, I'm positive for this thing, I want to kill it. When do you treat it then? So when symptoms. you've got bleeding stomach ulcers yeah. and when you've got yeah. full ulceration from this thing, eradicate it. Because we can with kind herbs. of correct it, uh, eradicate with herbs yeah. um, and in particular the cranberries, the Cranberry, ginger, ginger, turmeric, turmeric. Um, garlic, yep. that sort of Pistachios. stuff. Pistachio resin is really interesting because mm. I love pistachios. Those, those five yeah. things in the literature and, and particularly this paper, which was pretty gold I found, yeah. I thought it was fascinating, it just, just published recently. That that showed that that it is uh, they're the five that actually work and they've got the biochemical. What journal is that, Steve? This is the journal of diabetes. No, I don't think so. No. Um, What's that one? Gastro. WG. Uh, WG. World WG. Journal of Gastrointestinal Pharmacology and Therapeutics. Okay. Hey, I'm going to do paper of the week this week cool. on um, that we found a cool because we always oh, have these. Now cool we're doing one. this gut stuff. We talk gut stuff. We get some of the author, mainstream medical world coming at us. <laughs> <laughs> you crazy fools. There is no such thing as leaky gut wall. Oh, um, we, we, I didn't know that. Yeah, and the mm. medical world uses words like intestinal permeability and stuff like that instead or tight junction, tight gap junction and zonulins. And mm. So anyway, zonulins the good cool thing is the reason why I'm doing <clears throat> the paper of the week on that this week is because the Lancet Medical Journals published that not only does gut leaky gut wall exist but they believe it's a major cause of cancer yeah so now wow. the whole world's gonna have to go to a bugger it's there like we've even had all these testing for leaky gut wall available the lactulose manifold yeah like, and then the medical world's going no oh, there is no such thing well the british the british columbian um gastroenterology conference uh had all these gastroenterologists saying there is no such thing as leaky gut syndrome wow. the same week that lancet medical paper came out showing how it works and what it causes and all this sort of stuff and they said quote there is no evidence to suggest there's leaky gut syndrome. That's how out of touch... Why do they say now that Lancet's come out and said that? They were doing it at the same they, time. So they, they have to they, wait they, for they'll, next they'll year. They'll do this. Oh, psh, just ignore that. They, yeah. they don't look at the literature. Nah, it's terrible. Nah, they got ideas. And that. So the funny thing is, I used to say to them, okay, we'll explain tight gap junctions, explain zonulin. Yeah. <laughs> and then they're like, oh. And you've got to remember, vitamin D is extraordinarily good for um, treating helicobacter pylori. Oh, right? really? Low vitamin D So what did you say before about temperature? Yeah, low temperatures means you get more helicobacter pylori. Right. Higher temperatures related to vitamin D have lower <laughs> helicobacter pylori, and they've narrowed it down to vitamin D levels. Yeah, right. right. And it, and the, the the correlation is very very strong. Yeah. And that's because vitamin D has all sorts of things that helps those tight junctions in the gut you were telling you about. Yeah. But it's also great for the immune system, anti-inflammatory. Mm. So vitamin D, you know, and we're in the depths of winter here, and yeah. you know, none of us are going out sunbaking at lunchtime, so. Our vitamin D levels, we've got to be cautious. I got a good yeah, burst absolutely. of it last week in Texas. Oh my gosh, it was hot. Hey, oh, you lucky yeah. bugger. Mm. Yeah. Man, that's so yeah. interesting, eh? So what's the what do you reckon the university degree? They're drunks, aren't they? I believe alcohol is a major thing. Yeah. I reckon these people that vomit a lot, drink yeah. a lot, party a lot, get a lot more stomach ulcers. We oh, know absolutely. alcohol causes stomach ulcers, yeah. not just from ulceration. Maybe it does something to helicobacter, and that might be the link between uni students. Maybe. <laughs> Could be. That, that's an abstract be. link. It could, could be. I mean, the, the only other thing I'm... Th I, I, this Good is my, theory. Do you want to jump my theory? I'm only saying it because I went to uni. I've never been the same. Yeah. Well, if, if you go to uni... <laughs> oh, God, I've got four degrees. But if, if you go yeah, to uni... you weren't a drunk. 
I just, or, I just bullshit my way through one. Universities are less likely to be outdoor tradies. That's what I oh, was. Yeah, my, that was yeah, my, that's a good point. So you could have office work. You know, you can and, record that as a theory yeah, I've got. And they're more likely to be low socioeconomic <laughs> group. <laughs> you got to pay back the hex debt. Yeah. Or you they, could do what I did and become a muso and pay off as you go along. That's what no, I, I laid turf. That's how I paid yeah, for mine. Well, I was a landscaper mm-hmm. in North Queensland. Three months every year laying turf. Jeez. Get me that office job. Get me that Get me that office job. That was my motivation. <laughs> That's crazy stuff. So, yeah. so it's a really interesting bug. And, you know, it, it, it's got some good and it's got some, obviously, some bad. Yeah. And the treatment for it is horrendous with long-term PPIs, protein pump inhibitors, which are known to be carcinogenic. Yeah. So the natural really um, bad. things yeah, that regulate so stomach acid is route. getting the acid made at the right time so yes. your body doesn't need to make it at the wrong time. The natural and acids, if you would like to look for the natural and acids, my favorite one was Meadow Sweet. And Aye. it's a really good herb. It's a nice and, and acid. Um, I don't, of course, we wouldn't add to gut right because we don't want to be suppressing acid. But mm. when you mix meadow sweet with something um, mucilaginous, like the marshmallow root and mm. that sort of stuff, they're a nice coating and they have a nice and acid effect. And then you can hide something in that to break down the biofilm, I've which is question. like gut right. I've got a question for you. If, uh, you know, saliva and digestive enzymes and all the rest of it are really so important, mm. would the move today towards continuous grazing and eating and eating every three hours effectively even if you're not hungry have a, have a massive impact on this as well too Shit because yeah. i mean yeah. obviously you, you think today especially in the think uh, of acromanzia the, the, mm. the, up, the performance and all the rest of it is that especially for guys and girls that want to maintain maximum muscle mass and of course again there's been a lot preached about regular eating every three hours i mean you know even we heard some crazy things but people were setting their alarm to wake up at night to keep mm. the food coming which yeah, again we've showed we've shown from a hormonal point of view that that's exactly the wrong thing to mm. do but throughout the waking hours consistently grazing or eating to maintain a positive nitrogen balance that's got to have a massive impact on the stomach acids and on digestion yeah, absolutely but you can't, you don't have enough blood to be everywhere for starters. Understand mm-hmm. the simple principle that if you are thinking and moving, you're not digesting at your best. Mm. You actually, this is, you know, that whole Mediterranean paradox where they believe these people can, through Europe, mm. can get fat and everything. They still don't get heart disease or diabetes. It's basically because they sit down to eat. Yeah. Mm. Like if you are not getting out of the sympathetic nervous system, which keeps the blood out to your muscles and brain and into that parasympathetic nervous system, if you're not getting out of working mode, so we got, we're got split between two. We're either fight or flight, which is hurry, worry, money, um, or we rest and digest. Mm. You've actually got to get into that meditation. That's why your religion will say, say grace, to thank everyone for work and all that sort of stuff that got the food here, but right now we're thinking about food mm-hmm. and we're sitting down and doing that because mm-hmm. that you could do that. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, some people might have a ceremony, like we talked about soups and salads and teas or mm-hmm. um, positive affirmations and that sort of stuff, ways of just saying, thanks for all that stuff, I'm focusing on the food. So mm-hmm. the key is, if you're grazing th- every three hours and eating on the run, then you're not digesting mm-hmm. things properly. You're not capable of having acid and enzymes and everything working properly because you don't. You're not. Your body doesn't even know you're about to eat. Mm-hmm. Um, and lastly, while we aren't eating, we actually do other things. For example, we start tapping into our reserves and we start breaking things down. We start. Our body starts saying, "Hey, you need to eat." And the way our body registers that we need to eat is acid and enzyme changes. Saying, come on, start this fire cooking in the stomach and then it's mm. going to make you hungry and that sort of stuff. So, and also, we tend to get into a bit of fat burning and stuff like that, which puts different stuff in our mucus. So instead of constantly having sugar and proteins and fats in our mucus, in between meals when we're fasting, we put carbon in our mucus. Is that the acomansia? Yes. Mm. And carbon feeds strains of bugs like acomansia that are extremely important for regulating our metabolism, our um, stress regulation, our, um, our moods, as well as our performance. And what it'll basically do is say to the body, you are not starving. You can keep going. So the cool thing is, is we need this regular intermittent fasting. We need breaks so our mouth can change mm. and that would control our digestive tract. I mean, in a very, very basic, you know, correlation, you don't train, you know, 24 hours a day. It's the training that then creates the the intense, you know, reaction in the body yeah. and then it's the recovery time where you actually build and repair and that's when where you get when the When do you muscle. do that though? What's that, sorry? Well, when t- do we build and repair? Typically. When we're sleeping. Exactly. Yeah. So... When we're eating throughout the day, yeah. when you've got to realise that we're trying to space our meals out, we're doing that for hormonal stuff and we're doing that uh-huh. for that sort of thing. 
all of those nutrients that you're taking that might be anabolic mm. are not anabolic during the day. Mm. You're using it. You're catabolic. You're, you're breaking stuff down. Myself. You don't actually stop and build a whole heap of stuff during the day. So all of these nutrients that typically pool and when you're asleep at night, your body will go through and utilize them to grow. So having them every couple of hours is not that important unless you want to maintain certain levels of blood sugar or blood fat and control things like insulin and but, stuff. But this is where people use, for example, branched chain amino acids mm. in between meals or before they train and all the rest of it because they're terrified about breaking down muscle tissue. Mm. The theory is, is they go, right, instead of taking you know one step backwards and two steps forwards, I want to take no steps backwards and three steps forward. You know, mm. So they figure that yeah. if they can cheat the system by not allowing their muscle tissue to break down, that they're going to, you know, get better results over the long term. But again, it's not looking after the natural ebb and flow. The body is always the tide comes in, the tide goes out. There's mm. natural wave cycles. But, you know, we've got to get back to that. Yes. So anyway, we can define and, that. Oh, there's day. so many too. Because on further that you've got talking about cell cycle turnover, longevity. There's so much to it because the more you Huge. consume and the more often you consume, yeah. your body utilizes yeah. this stuff, and you get exaggerated cell cycle turnover. Yeah, yeah, you build more, but you don't build as much as for long. You well, and early. that's it. You're looking at you know DNA strand splitting mm. and, and all sorts of other repair that the body requires to do, rather than just consistent anabolic activity, mm. which mm. means that if there's a little hidden nasty cancer cell in there and you don't allow the body to go in and effectively deal with that and you're constantly in a situation where you're anabolic and and um building up more cells and more tissue well guess what but also don't forget so what she just i will forget so don't forget what steve i said before were the way things like turmeric and that work they actually interfere with the bug's ability to make amino acids that they need for their growth cycle mm. if we're supplementing those amino acids we directly they the bugs get them before we get them mm, yeah. so you've also we now we've only just on the the crest of the wave understanding what we consume that has nothing to do with us like these bugs they get it first so they get first dibs and we still we've never really fully understood that and we're only just starting to understand mm. what we eat what is there for them and what we get yeah, and that's why we struggle a lot with natural medicine and they talk about bioavailability mm. saying that no these natural medicines are not bioavailable or something so no because you haven't worked out what the bacteria are doing to them yet yes bacteria can, converting them and changing them and and they're utilizing them yes. and sharing them and but you can see very very soon that they're going to come out with super strains of bugs they put in people and then tell you to eat or feed them a particular you know vitamin or supplement regime so that you can have better endurance or better power but yeah, again again because they're not following the laws of nature, it's going to get out of control and you're going to have issues, you know. Well, like Steve, I said with Helicobacter pylori, it's in all of us. It's been around since that, you know, forever. And um, the bastards change. Yeah. They keep evolving. So you yeah. might go through and think, oh, I'm a genius because I've worked out that I can make a particular probiotic. You may not have any clue what you've got because they've got the same bloody name, they've got the same identification. You just don't know which bloody version of it you've got. You might be supplementing with a mutated form that does more harm than good. Yeah, <clears throat> too much of a good smarter. thing. We can't, uh, always. Be, we can't pretend yes. to be smarter than nature. That's when we no. get ourselves into trouble. That's it. And, and, and you, you, know, you mentioned before about you know, upregulating Akkermansia. The great berberine, which is found in fantastic yeah. herbs, boosts Akkermansia in the gut. And, so and breaks drugs, down biofilm yeah. and antimicrobial. Berberine's amazing. It really didn't taste, taste like, like bile. Us. Yeah, that's yeah, shocking. Because we're running out of time. Yeah. What? So, yes. anything else to say on, on this? No. Okay. <laughs> Guys, we've run out of time, mm. but we'll be back next week with some more, no doubt. Uh, sure. Yeah, stuff Can't and wait. things. Stuff and things. Any last words? Nah, Steve. No, I'm good. Congress type. Oh, <laughs> oh dear. Go, go to yeah. your dark place, Matt. Um, all right. Oh, oh. Sorry, your happy place. I meant your happy place. Your dark place. <laughs> Not John's place. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All, all right, right, guys. Aru. Goodbye. See you next week. See you, See you next later. week. Bye bye. <laughs>